out of vain. This culture was born. In life's shadowed places, the magic was born. Well, the tribes, they regrouped again. Fought their wars on a brand new plane. And through their strife, their manhood was reborn. And so from all this back and Art by Creative Design is a non-profit organization incorporated in 2017. It is led by a team of educators who've come together to play their part as citizens interested in the development of the education system of Trinidad and Tobago. ABCD advocates for an emphasis to be placed on the promotion and facilitation of arts education from which the benefits to our society are wide-ranging and multifaceted. A decision was made to create an innovative and cohesive approach that would assist in bringing about a positive change especially in arts education at the secondary school level. Our one-of-a-kind projects are designed to facilitate the implementation of visual and performing arts curriculum so an understanding of elements of what is being used in our nation's school at all levels is key. As a result, consultation with officials of the Ministry of Education Curriculum Development and Planning Division, our young learners and other stakeholders is critical to the development process. Art by Creative Design has introduced to the community of Trinidad and Tobago our flagship projects. As we move forward to obtain our objectives, the ABCD team is focused on the next phase, which is to design and utilize instruments to measure the impact of our activities. The data will allow us to further illustrate how our programs have improved our young creative artists, how the learnings impact on academic performance in other non-arts subjects, and learners' overall well-being and development. We want children to learn to love learning, and we believe that art education is key to attaining this for every child in our nation's schools. We are on a mission to encourage everyone to dream, create, and achieve. We believe art education for all, art education benefits all. And a pleasant good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to our first Talking the Things session. And this is being brought to you by Art by Creative Design. Yes, and this is all part of our ABCD virtual booth as part of the Caribbean Association of Principals of Secondary Schools, their 28th biennial conference. Yes, and their focus is on breaking barriers, transitioning beyond the norm. This afternoon, we have quite a panel, and we're going to be focusing on the arts and education. To help us through, we have, I'm going to introduce our moderator for this afternoon's session, Ms. Deborah Matthews. Deborah Matthews has been a cultural worker in the field of theater for almost 20 years. She has worked alongside some of the most recognizable names in the local culture sector as an operations manager, graphic designer, creative arts facilitator, trainer, marketing consultant, writer, and stage manager. She is also the founder of the 1990 Project, an undertaking geared towards cultivating conversations about Trinidad and Tobago's history of resistance and rebellion and the ensuing collective trauma harbored in our living memory by using creative expression and applied theater as her tools of choice. Deborah holds a BA in Literatures in English and Theater Arts and an MPhil in Cultural Studies. 
She currently lectures in cultural studies at the Faculty of Humanities and Educations Department for Literary Communications and Cultural Studies at the University of the West Indies St. Augustine. Her research interests include ritual drama, kinesthetic memory in performance, festivals as artistic practice, and Calypso as oral history. So you know, we will be in great hands this afternoon. So without further ado, we're going to go to our billboard and when we come back, we'll be joined by Miss Deborah Matthews. Right. Thank you very much, Iana, for that very warm introduction. Hello, everyone. My name is Deborah Matthews, and I am the moderator for today's panel discussion on Talking the Things, Arts and Education. So uh, good afternoon to our audience in Trinidad and Tobago, and of course, throughout the Caribbean region. Welcome to the Art by Creative Design booth at the CAPS Conference 2021. This afternoon, we talk in the things. And I have the distinct honor of moderating today's panel discussion on the arts in education. I am joined by four professionals who labor in the vineyard of the education and entertainment sectors of Trinidad and Tobago, Ms. Rita Antoine, Mr. Marlon De Beek, Mr. Paul Julian, and Dr. Josephine Torrell Brown. So before we begin today's discussion, allow me to very quickly introduce each panelist to you. First, we have Miss Rita Antoine, a product of Naprima Girls High School, who started her teaching career in 1998 at the Saparia Senior Comprehensive School. She refined her professional development at the Valsane Teachers College. She read for her first degree, a Bachelor of Arts Visual Arts Special with Human Resource Management at the DCFA at UE St. Augustine and then completed a postgraduate diploma in the teaching of visual arts in 2004 at the UE School of Education. By 2007, she started exhibiting and marketing her own work with the help of the Art Society of Trinidad and Tobago, Canvas Caribbean, and other notable NGOs. By 2020, she started her own artist studio business, Arian Designs, and her first line of handcrafted cotton and silk batik wearable art pieces were consigned to the Acerite Nature Center. In 2018, she represented Trinidad and Tobago at UNESCO's sixth art camp at, at, in Andorra, sorry, and her pieces on colors for the planet were exhibited in New York and Paris in 2019. She completed her master's in education with a concentration in curriculum in 2010 and her Master of Philosophy in July of 2020. She was assigned as the Acting Curriculum Coordinator in the Port of Spain and Environs Education District in March 2021. Rita's work is therefore inspired by her many long-standing relationships with people and places and nature. She believes that by connecting with the elements of one's natural environment, that people develop and learn how best to communicate across existing boundaries. Please, ladies and gentlemen, use the emoticon function right below, right here on Zoom, and put your hands together and welcome to this virtual panel, Miss Rita Antoine. Rita, wave, wave for the people now, thanks. Okay, so next, <laughs> next allow me to introduce Mr. Marlon De Beek, who has years and years of experience in production management, festival development, cultural diplomacy through international cultural exchanges and the development of new audiences for the arts. He holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Carnival Studies with a minor in Communication Studies, a Practitioner Certificate in Drama and Theatre Education, a Certificate in Transformational Leadership in Implementing Sustainable Development Goals, and is currently pursuing a Postgraduate Diploma in International Relations all from the UE at St. Augustine. And in addition to this, he holds an MBA from the University of Bedfordshire in the United Kingdom. 
Marlon has performed internationally with Living Arts Inc. of New York while touring the UK, Eastern Europe, Australia, and New Zealand in the opera Porgy and Bess during the period 2005 to 2008. He is a two-time Kasik Award winner, and his stage roles include Judas in Jesus Christ Superstar, Gaston in Beauty and the Beast, Roger in the musical Rent, Jean Valjean in Les Miserables, and Don Jose in the opera Carmen. Hi, hi, hi. He is a former member of the Marionette Chorale and the Trinity Tenors. At present, he's the CEO at the Napri Mabol and the founder, creative director of MD Beyond, a cultural relations company which specializes in creative collaborative projects between artists and also facilitating cultural exchanges. Again, use the emoticon function right here on Zoom to put your hands together to welcome to our virtual panel, Mr. Marlon DeBeek. Marlon, give everybody a wave. Thank you. Okay, great. <laughs> Next on our panel this afternoon is Mr. Paul Julian, who is the head of Department of Visual and Performing Arts at the San Fernando East Secondary School. He's a part-time lecturer at the School of Education at the UE at St. Augustine, and he holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Visual Arts, and a postgraduate diploma in education, both from the UE St. Augustine and an MBA in sustainable energy management from the Arthur Lockjack Global School of Business. He has 20 years of experience as a visual arts teacher and 15 years experience as an assistant examiner and table leader for the Caribbean Examination Council's art and design examination. Again, please use the emoticon function right here on Zoom to put your hands together and welcome to our panel, Mr. Paul Julian. And Mr. Julian, just give everybody a nice quick wave. Thank you. <laughs> and lastly, but definitely not least, our fourth panelist this afternoon, Dr. Josephine Torrell Brown. She is an educator, an advocate for the arts and culture, and she holds a teacher's diploma, a Bachelor of Arts in Musical Arts and a Master of Philosophy and Cultural Studies, all from the UE at St. Augustine. Her doctorate, which was conferred by the University of Trinidad and Tobago, is also in cultural studies. She contributes to the education and cultural landscape of Trinidad and Tobago and the wider Caribbean region through training and arts adjudication, which includes service as the chief adjudicator for the international Sokamuna competition. Dr. Torrell Brown has conducted critical action research using the arts as a vehicle to affect academic success among students and has also conducted numerous workshops and training incorporating strategies such as artists in schools, integrated arts, and the arts in education approach to teaching other curricular content using dance and drama, music, and visual arts as the vehicle. She is a curriculum officer with the Visual and Performing Arts Unit of the Curriculum Planning and Development Division of the Ministry of Education in Trinidad and Tobago. So, all right, by now, everybody, you know what to do. Make use of that emoticon function right here on Zoom and put your hands together to welcome to our virtual panel, Dr. Josephine Torrell Brown. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time from your busy schedules to join us here in order to talk the things. If your mic is not unmuted, please unmute yourself and say, say, say hi. Hi, good evening, good afternoon. Hello everybody. everyone, hello. <laughs> hi everybody. Um, just a note to our watching audience, all you could talk the thing on them too, you know. We can have a conversation without you. So please use the chat function right here on Zoom to ask any questions that you might have as the conversation progresses or you can make your comments and we will feed them as much as possible in the limited time we have available today to our panelists. So, okay, panel, first things first, we're talking about the importance of the arts and integration of the arts into schools. So why do you believe that this isn't a more universal conversation? We know that the field is focused on STEM instead of STEAM and STREAM. Of course, the A stands for arts and the R stands for reading and research, right? And STEAM and STREAM. So what do you think we could do? What can be done to move arts education and skills from the periphery, right? Of widely being known as extracurricular into a more central role of integration in our classrooms. Dr. Torrell Brown, I'll ask you to start the ball rolling, please. 
Great, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Happy to be here. Um, I want to commend you because that's a very important question. And um, I think because of the value that the arts have, it really has a place in the curriculum because the arts helps to humanize an individual. That's the kind of person we want to take our country forward. It's not only academic performance, but also the social skills. So what can we do to contribute to that? Awareness. We have to make persons aware because a lot of persons, as we are aware, think that the arts are for the special persons and gifted persons. But we have to really teach them that the arts are for anyone, it's all inclusive, and the arts can be done in several different ways. So it must be an integral part of the curriculum, not just on the timetable, but it must be actioned. So it must be taught in two major ways. One, arts education, that is teaching arts for arts sake, the disciplines and the fundamentals of them. And also how can we incorporate the arts into other subject areas? So we are looking at strategies such as the arts and education approach, integrated arts, all those kinds of things. So really awareness needs to be had, not just within the school system, but generally throughout the nation, both parents, teachers, principals, everybody need to be aware of the value of the arts. So I would start with education and awareness. Right, Mr. Lebeek, would you like to weigh in on this? Yes, um, definitely. And I want to agree the, um, with Dr. Brown on this because the education side is, is so important, but I think what, what is the critical thing in bringing arts and arts, and, and arts education to the, to the front of the, of the line is bridging that gap between the education and arts for arts sake and the knowledge of arts and culture but showing the industry relationship alongside the arts. So whilst you're studying engineering and you're studying social studies and all these other things, mathematics, English, and you might get a very clear indication of, okay, I study English and literature, I could be, an, I could be a teacher, or I might get into writing, or I might get into journalism, right? That in itself, we need to bring the arts to the center that's showing if you study music, I could be a professional musician. When I was just performing in a band, I could start scoring music, I could compose music for film, I could work in an advertising company and conceptualize things. So there are other areas that just arts, a lot of arts students right now coming out of the secondary school, going into university, are going into teaching arts, but their careers in the arts outside of teaching, right? Such as working as professional artists, working as entrepreneurs. So I think from the educational standpoint, we need to show the very clear idea and clear, correct part and bridging that gap for students where, oh, I could actually study the arts and I could be this because there are people out there in the industry who are actually artists, who are actually dancers and choreographers, actual writers and, and playwrights and so on, so that they can actually see these tangible careers that they could pursue. Exactly so. Mr. Julian? Mr. Julian. Okay, I think we've lost Mr. Julian. So I'm going to ask, excuse me, Ms. Antoine. Yes, thank you very much. And good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah. Um, on the issue of what goes on in schools, uh, uh, Mr. Dibby touched on it in terms of leveling the playing field. The arts bring democracy. And we, at the start of this session, we heard some of the initiatives that ABCD is involved in. And one of them was alluded to in terms of measuring success and finding ways of looking at students' performances and finding ways of crediting students so that as they go through schooling, the curriculum, yes, teachers will teach to the arts, they can integrate and so on. But at the end of the day, the major value that we find and we are able to enjoy from having the arts as part of our system, our education system, is that it builds democracy, equity. It gives each child a fighting chance. And uh, we must leverage on that. Today, we have students 
were it not for the arts, would they have been able to cope with the last 10, 12 months of their school life? Mm. The visual arts, the digital media, the use of apps, all of which are founded on the arts. So, Mr. DeBeek and Mr. Dr. Torrell Brown, your point is extended in terms of what we do in schools, what we should be leveraging on to bring about democracy in schools. Thank you. Great. So we're, we're about using the arts to level the playing field. We saw, uh, like Ms. Antoine has mentioned, uh, over the past year and a bit with school being online, that we've seen students have to um, have to take a very, very hard look of the way they receive their education, as well as teachers having to rely upon skills that we in the arts know all too well in order, <laughs> in order to teach, right? So arts leveling the playing field, right? Making a connection with the industry, yeah? And using a two-pronged approach, bringing awareness of the arts in schools, teaching arts for art's sake, as well as using the arts as a means of integrating into the classroom. I think we have Mr. Julian again. Mr. Julian, are you there? Yes. I'm Great. Right. Lend yeah. your voice to the conversation, please. Yeah. First of all, I want to say good afternoon to the esteemed panel, Rita, uh, Mr. DePeak. All names I've heard before, people who are doing tremendous things. Um, the, the esteemed doctor as well. Um, Thank you. Yana and Deborah, good afternoon. Hi. Um, well, I want to just weigh in a bit on this whole idea of um, arts integration because I think that um, we have to find a way given the opportunity to reset, you know, or press the reset button on our education system based on our last um, consultation there, as well as the new normal we are, we are in, is that we have... Okay, as Mr. Julian started to get into the swing of the thing, he froze again, <laughs> but that's okay. All right, technical difficulties, it's all part of the thing. Yeah, okay. Um, I think that we're going to go for a short break Right, we're going to go for a short break and we'll come right back into the discussion.
Okay, welcome back. And we are going to just keep the conversation going. We have established that an arts education is central to classroom engagement and also in linking students to an industry career path in 2021 and beyond. So uh, panel, I ask you in plain English and bad manners, right? Because we talk in the takes, yeah? What exactly do we want to achieve? And how exactly do you propose in your professional capacity and also as practitioners, how do you propose that we achieve these things? Anybody? I could call names too, you know, Miss Sidi Beek. Oh, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think one of the, from where I sit here at the bowl and what I've been exposed to even before working in the Ministry of Culture and the Culture Division, I think it's important that there's a language that must happen throughout. So it's not just, so the education system does one thing, but the, all industries must have that understanding and openness to culture and arts as a form of transforming the operations of any organization. So artists contribute significantly to highly creative environments. So whether it's marketing, advertising, project management, all these things, um, development like urban planning and development, artists are very critical in those places because they are able to identify how society function in these places. Right? Um, so it's important that artists are present, they are around the table when you're talking things about society and culture and how people function in a city that's being transformed with new buildings and a lot of you know urbanization. They need to be present in housing planning. When you're doing planning for housing, you need to be present in health sector and the conversations around health and health and health care. They need to be present in tourism, of course, and they need to be present in so many other industries so that they, because they have that ability to see beyond and below the, the, the other levels of work and they're able to dig deep into the technical aspects and the creative aspects, how the public functions in this field or how they will potentially function in this field. So I think it's important that, that we don't just treat arts and culture as a decorative device you don't only call them in when you have to do the launch of the event or the launch of the project, but there is someone with training in theater, in literature, in visual art, sitting around that table doing the development um, in the development plan, in the planning, in the urban planning. And I've seen it happen in other places. I mean, around the world, there's something called creative place making. So once there's the urban development, there are artists and creative people sitting around the table. So if you say you want to put an amphitheater in a, a plaza or there's this open seating, there's open um, green space, if there's parking, the artists around the table is able to say, oh, well, this can be multi-purpose, right? This particular piece of, this piece of furniture should be designed by the artists. It should be decorated by the artists. If you put in green spaces, are the green spaces, does it, does it include the, City to upkeep it, or can people go into that space and actually plant, right? Can they plant their own food in that space? Can they plant flowers in that space? You know, so making the artist present wherever people are, right? And I think um, Ms. Antoine spoke about that in terms of, you know, leveling the playing field and, um, and, and getting people involved. Once society is around uh, and is present in the, in the mix, artists need to be present so that they could help bridge that gap. It's about helping them bridge, using them to bridge the gap. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Thank you. And somebody in the chat is agreeing with you, right? Uh, Miss Dorridge, Michelle Dorridge said, have artists work on display everywhere, invest in resources from ECCE all the way up, prove that the arts is needed to make the economy grow. We need a very serious investment. Right. Okay, Miss Antoine, I'm sorry I cut you off just now. Go yes, ahead. Yes, I'm just jumping in on that discussion. And uh, therefore, when you look at what artists do, we adapt and adopt in every single thing that we do, a design thinking approach and process the product mentality throughout. The designer of this event is an artist. 
We need more artists in politics if we are to take this country forward. Yes, and therefore, when you look at how schools learn, what can the school learn from the art making process, the design thinking? When we teach a class, and we only measuring math and science and English simply because there can only be one correct answer to a multiple choice question. But when we bring in the arts, we move from the lower order thinking skills to a more higher order thinking. So therefore we begin to engage our students to synthesize, to evaluate, to make judgment. So, in terms of arts and schools, arts education in schools, we need to improve on how we measure what we do and understand the value of the arts in schools, not just there as a decorative feature. You don't call the art teacher when it's graduation to make table center pieces. You engage in the critical thinking, problem-solving approach that the students are going to leave with, go out into the world of work, and regardless of what career, the design thinking process would have informed how they function. Yes? Well said. Mr. Julian. Yes, um, I just want to add that... Um, um, so what the both um, other panels have said is that we have to look at also in terms of um, my internet is a bit patchy. I apologize. That's um, okay. <laughs> like in terms of how sustainable these um, ideas are, right? Because we know that they are viable. How, how can they be sustainable? But also being mindful that we are living in an energy economy, right? How can the arts be the, the energy for Trinidad and Tobago that could supply the resources that we need from the outside because we we know that our energy resources are not finite right they're definitely inf um, they're not um, infinite definitely finite so where, where does the only so much money is poured into the energy economy to keep our our standard of living going we know that the arts have the potential to even do the same type of thing because if we develop you know from the base right the raw talent that we have through the education system, right? We can um, look at, at how we can sustain the ideas, these ideas of having the arts as a central focus uh, for our, our education going forward, right? Because we need to also investigate our national budget, as Rita said, you know, if more, more artists are in politics, then probably we could have something going. How much of this? money that was put in the education system goes towards the arts because the education are the second highest budget portion of the budget how much of it goes to the arts and education okay dr torrell brown great so i'm happy you all steered that conversation in that direction you all are actually playing in my garden because my recent um research, actually my, my PhD research, is actually looking at intangible cultural tourism as an option for economic diversification. So what you are speaking about, using the arts, having artists and artists involved in and, and making our cultural products become tourism products, that is important because you are right. We cannot depend on oil and gas. We saw what happened, oil going below zero dollars, US dollars during the pandemic. And several years we have had recessions. So we do need to look at something else as diversification option. And what do we have? And what do we have in abundance? And that is culture. We are rich in the arts and culture. So that's one way I think we can help our economy. And how do we get there? We are speaking about the orange economy. That is our creatives. They play a very important role. So all these creative persons, we have your right, have them involved in planning, in implementation, in guidance, in policy and decision making. And I think we are in a place where we can actually do that now. Why? Because we do have 
visual and performing arts as core subjects on the curriculum. So that's a good place to start. What we need to do now is to make sure that they are not just there on a the timetable. I can't stress that enough. It must be action. And I want to add that we also need to have a new attitude when, for research. We need to look, so many persons come out of you. We all of us here came out of our university and would have done research. Where has that information gone? So we need to be data-driven, look at what the research is saying, implement it as fast as possible, being realistic, of course, of, we must also have the resources, as was mentioned earlier on, but coming with that in our school system is training. And we also need our teachers to go brave, as they say, and don't feel that it's only for special persons, gifted persons, or I don't have any talent everyone can implement and participate in, in the arts at some level. And the curriculum planning and development division can support in terms of training. As I say, it's already on the curriculum. And we already have some resources in place. For example, we have the Pan in the Classroom program that puts steel pants in schools. So that's a start. And that has been transformed into the Multicultural Music Program Unit, where we do have peripathetic teachers going and teaching music in schools. So now we just need to get the other subjects on board. But again, we need the, a whole staff approach where the, uh, all teachers, administration, etc., cetera, sees the big picture how the arts can help to transform lives, not just academic performance, but social, emotional, spiritual, et cetera. That's my okay. contribution. Well, thank you very much. And I'm going to piggyback on that last comment that Dr. Torrell Brown made in terms of bringing teachers and administrators into, you know, giving them some buy-in here, right? And I want, to, I want to double down on the question and ask, how practically, can we get teachers, administrators, principals, everybody, toot bagai, and I'm even talking about parents, right? How do we get them to practically buy into this train of thought to move forward? Any ideas? Well, Debbie, I mean, I, what I want to, I have a question. I, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not an educator in that sense, I guess. I mm -hmm. contribute to the, to the chain in terms of education, but mm -hmm. my question, how, is there, and I've gotten feedback from colleagues of mine who are teachers, friends of mine who are teachers, is there that general sense of respect across the board in terms of the of teachers in schools, the value of a maths teacher, of a physics teacher, of a biology teacher, of a literature teacher, that they are valued the same way or the visual art, the performing arts teacher, the visual arts teacher is valued the same way as them. Mm -hmm. So that from the, from the system of education and, the, and the, the community of teachers, is there a level of value across? Because if students in the school population only see the visual arts teacher or the dance teacher, the theater teacher, as the teacher who could only do that and teach them children, right? Mm -hmm. If they could only see that, what if, how, how are we going to bridge that? How are we going to bring that, that conversation together? Because if the math teacher is celebrated more and the, and, and the physics teacher is celebrated more, and the achievements of those teachers in terms of the passes in their classes, who get any scholarships and so on, if that's celebrated more than what the achievement of a visual arts student or a dance student, then we have to question that. So it's about value and value across the whole teacher population that every teacher see, you know, you're a professional in this field. You're a professional music teacher. You're a professional theater arts teacher. And you're a professional math teacher, right? So that they all can sit around a table in an urban planning something. They can all sit and consult for a minister because they're all professionals in their fields. So if teachers, so my question is, is that that level of appreciation and recognition of the profession of teaching the arts as same as your professional teaching physics or any other, other subject. I think it needs to start from there as well. Agreed. <laughs> Does any other panelists want to weigh in on what Ms. Libik has just said? Well, from my perspective, we have to work harder sometimes to prove ourselves. And I believe that every art teacher should be a practitioner because I'm not going to a doctor who is not practicing surgery. I 
I'm not going to a doctor or a dentist who is not dealing with the art and the art of dental work. So as an art teacher, out of necessity, one, and secondly, out of more sort of wrangling with who I am really. Am I a teacher or am I an artist? And weighing that over the years, I've come to realize that perhaps I'm sometimes more of an artist than an educator. And making the, the choice to practice alongside my professional work in the Caribbean, in, 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 the, in the community, um, it really, you know, con it, it really begs that question. How do we change that? What is it, you know, it, it calls for a paradigm shift in the way we treat professionals in this country. And I must say, you know, being an artist, I decided that, you know, you have to market your, yourself, you have to market your work. And unfortunately, it was only when I sold my first piece of work as, a, as an artist that I felt I was an artist. That's so unfortunate. It took me years to realize that, listen, the validation comes from your passion, your hard work, and self-respect for what you do is more important. However, you can't take self-respect and go to Massey. So we do need a paradigm shift in terms of how we view arts education for the entire student population, not just at primary, not just at secondary, at the tertiary level. How do we bring the arts up in terms of tertiary education and professionalizing the thing. Talking the thing. Talking the things. Right. <laughs> so I'm going to stick up in right there. Right. And we're going to go for a quick break. And we're going to come straight back in to hear from Dr. Torrell Brown and Mr. Julian on this same point. Okay. So to the break and then back. Right, so very quickly before I go to Mr. Julian to ask, um, ask his comments on the last point that we made in the conversation, I will just talk a little bit about the little ad that you just saw for the postgraduate program in cultural studies at the UE St. Augustine. Um, this year we have an MPhil intake and a PhD intake uh, for the program and the deadline date is on July the 31st, that's, that's Saturday coming, right? It is an opportunity for us, whether you are an arts practitioner or not, to learn from the, the foremost and most eminent scholars in the Caribbean about our space, to talk about the region with a global focus. Yeah, I am a student of the program. Um, <laughs> Dr. Torrell Brown is a student of the program. Yeah, so I can't, I can't impress upon you enough um, how important it is for us to talk about the arts, to talk about culture, culture in terms of how we create meaning in the Caribbean and to learn from Caribbean scholars on that. So if you want more information about it, please, I will put the information in the chat, right? But just to let you know um, that the intake is open, the deadline is on Saturday, God willing, and I am fully willing to meet with you on the phone, on Zoom, 
to talk about ways that you could get involved in the program. Um, you don't have to be an arts practitioner to be involved in the program, right? To do your MPhil, to do your PhD, yeah? But if you are an arts practitioner, whether in film, dance, theater, or music, you can actually use your art as your research method to do your work. And I am fully willing to meet with you to talk about that just a little bit more, yeah? Okay, so Mr. Julian, let me hear your thoughts on our last point. Right, so um, my thoughts basically goes to a question that was asked in the chat. Someone asked about how do you get um, parents in a homeschooling situation involved, right? Um, so how do you, I think so, um, Rita is writing that some validation must take place where the art, the artist, the art teacher, the teacher of the arts, for, for instance, is validated in some particular ways. It's the only way you can get it, that, that kind of traction going because as I said before, we live in an energy economy. So, um, and anything unrelated to energy is not really um, put to the forefront. It's more like on the side of decorative kind of piece of something. So um, what needs to happen is that validation of that the arts are important in the, uh, for, for our, probably even our survival, you could even put it, right? And once once you start put, putting it like that, you then you, you, you can then start a conversation about where does it fit into everything else? Because we have to now unclutter and take apart the system where that says science, history, social studies, geography, everything is unrelated, right? And put the arts as the focus for the transfusion of all those other ideas. Right, so we have a paradigm shift that can happen because we have the opportunity through the last um, education, um, conf, um, what, what I put it, um, uh, um, conference on education, right? As well as we have this um, new normal that we're in. So the, we have an opportunity, we have to make use of the opportunity to change what it is that um, we are saying that art contributes to our survival per se, right? So because it's really difficult as an artist to survive without validation. No one will take on your, your film. No one will look at your painting. No one will look at your, at your play, except it's validated. And you cannot be validated in a small group to be important. Right, okay. Dr. Torrell Brown. Yes, thank you. So I would like to, to be um, moved a bit more the optimistic side of things. Um, from the research that I have just concluded, um, as I mentioned before, we are in a fairly good starting point. Um, recently, the Ministry of Culture, at that point in time, now it's merger tourism, there is a revised draft cultural policy document. And that document recognizes the value of the arts. Um, so it speaks to, to, to citizens being culturally confident citizens. It speaks to using the arts, incorporating arts and artists and artists in various realm of society and um, entrepreneurship and so on. So the question now is how do we move from paper? How do we move from talk? We talk in the thing. So how do we move from talking the thing to action in the thing, right? So therefore, I think what needs to happen is a network. We see the movement that happened for Black Lives Matter and how that was able to effect change we artists and artists need to come together and lobby for what we think needs to happen. Because we have pockets of voices here and there in society, but we really need to come together as, as a group with several voices, but singing the same song. So that's, that's in, in the public domain, so to speak, in society. But coming back to education, now, how do we action this thing? Again, we need to build a network within the education system of those arts practitioners, the tutors, teachers, everyone who has some kind of knowledge, some kind of experience. That network now needs to support each other. 
So again, using um, the data, using the research, getting best practices, model lessons, mother schemes, et cetera. And let us start with there from the children, from, from infants or sorry, ECC goes straight up. So we are working that in the education, education system. And again, moving from just the talk and from the theory, we are going to action it into performances. So we need to have our children do the practical along with the theory, expose them to several kinds of um, events and opportunities, and that already happens. But we need to not have it just for because this one can sing, or I see this one can paint and draw. We need to give everyone a chance because we don't know what is underlying. Um, from what a, a student is not showing, there may be underlying skills and talent there, but just that the child uh, is hindered by some kind of psychological or emotional um, attitude that wouldn't allow him to come out. So I just want to make the point again that when we look at, at several areas of arts in Trinidad and Tobago, there are some good things. There are some positive steps. We now have to move that from talking from and actioning. We need to move it from paper to really um, implement. And therefore we need all hands on deck. And as I'm saying again, create if I want to use uh, musical terminology, create a choir, different voices singing the same song. So networking, I would say. Great. So we move in from talking the things to doing the things. Action, man, action, right? So I want okay. to grab that point, yeah, and segue into this question, right? So what, what systems and resources, what do we have? What, what already exists in Trinidad and Tobago today? Um, what do we need to put into place? And what, um, what clear items um, for change do we have that we can bring to the fore now? Mr. Julian, start the ball rolling. I, I saw recently that I think the Ministry of Culture has this platform called Music TT, a very positive. Um, they've taken some new upcoming artists and they're working with them um, to help develop their skills market and marketing. Um, you, I think you could, if you go on their Instagram, you see the different um, um, things these, these new artists are involved in. And, and they also have information about how you can market yourself as a musician, right? The so music TT. Um, the, things like those, I think, are important. But where, how do you get from there to there, right? So th there's some steps that had to be taken. We can't skip too many steps. Um, and what I think it needs to happen as well is, is the appreciation of, of uh, that, that if you... Um, if you, if you could be able to pull all the energies of, of Trinidad and Tobago together and, and we look at something like Carnival, Carnival is something, a very large platform that pull a lot of those creative energies together. We have to, and but again, we are in a pandemic, right? We, that, that is now, but we have to look at how do you take all this type of cultural energy, this type of cultural creativity that goes on and on and, and perpetuates itself most times through families, right? To um, homes, people learn to bring creativity in the pan, music, it, mass, etc. right? And it comes into this large explosion of um, creativity, right? So um, being able to harness that, I think is um, what um, needs to be done. Something like what Music TT is doing, but you need to do it, it needs to be done on a, on a grand scale. Yes, indeed. Mr. DeBeek. Uh, I, I want to chime in on, on Mr. Julian's last point, but even before that, uh, Dr. Brown's point. Um, in terms of the, the, I think the systems, there are some systems that are in place and there are, I agree with that, there are some good things happening because for example, here where I am at the Bowl. board, um, the career, the big career that you see yourself in working in the theater is as a theater te technician. Mm -hmm. And quite a few of the technicians would have had some interest, would have whet their appetite, at least at the secondary school level, 
even if it wasn't in their school, it would have been at that time in their life. So whether they're working in a production, they have a friend who's involved in a choir or Best Village, that sort of thing, it would have wet their appetite that, oh, I could actually be involved in the arts some, in some way. And then secondly, oh, I could actually do theater or technical theater in the arts, I could do lighting, I could do costume design. And then they explore that further through the school or through some organization, some performing arts group, some arts organization, and then they could go to UWE, right? Um, but as Mr. Julia uh, mentioned, like music teaching, which is their program is on the Ministry of Trade, um, arts organizations like arts associations, National Drama Association, National Dance Association, Trade and Theatre Workshop, I think they also play some critical role in, in, in that education process. So you have the education that's happening through a VAPA program. But then there's a nonprofit arts organization that provides that level of education. Whether it's practical during the course of doing a show or mounting an exhibition or doing some design work, you'll get you get that education process that inside there as well. Um, and just jumping back again to Dr. Brown's point about the networking, I think one of the most robust things that could happen if it's focused on and developed more, especially in the, I don't know if I'm using the right term, but in the non-prestige schools, are uh, the alumni associations. And I think wherever successful artists are, they need to tap back and go back to those schools because yeah. it, it's so important for a student, an art student, to see the people who work in the industry, right? So we all see a Kess and a Marshall and so on, but they're kind of far removed. Eh? You want to get a little bit more, you want to see who came out of your, your school and it's even if there's a successful visual artist, a successful filmmaker, a successful fashion designer, a su successful musician or dancer. You want to meet those people. You want them to come back to your school and show you this is the career path I took. These are the struggles, yes, it wasn't easy, but this is the reality and this is what is possible for you. And so bridging the gap, again, and you will hear me see her a lot about bridging that gap with the actual the student who has this dream, who has this desire, but they really want to see those people who are out there actually doing it and who would have actually gone to my school or a school like mine, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And come from a community like mine. My last point brings me to community. How do we reposition VAPA schools or schools with VAPA programs as key players in the communities where they're located, right? So we could say, yes, uh, a NAPS throws out good um, science scholars and people who end up working in, in, in um, law or medicine. What schools throw in all the great artists? What schools are throwing all the good dance, dancer, choreographer? What schools are throwing all the good writers? And how that becomes an important part in the building of that community of the school, but the wider community of where the school is located. So the narratives have to start shifting. The narratives have to be, start shifting. The schools have to celebrate their alumni more and see the alumni, not only as a form of pride for the school, but something more tangible or realistic, oh, I could do that. Because so-and-so -so came out of my school and they came from my community and they walk the same track I walk. And I, this is a possibility for me. It's about really building that relationship. So really touching on that point of community and network. Mm -hmm. I think um, if we take that sort of approach as well in the, in the schools. You know, I want to fling my hand in the air and just say amen, right? <laughs> <laughs> there is so much, there is so much to say about this. There's so much that I want to get to, but I just glanced at the time and I realized that we're out of time for today, right? Um, so I'm going to have to end with you, Marlon. Yeah. And I'm going to ask everyone, um, to, I'm just going to ask you to point your attention to the chat where a feedback form was, um, was posted please just click on the link and fill in that feedback form for us. So moving forward with this week's, um, this week's event, event listing, we will know what we're doing good, what we need to work on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so I would like to thank our collaborators, the Caribbean Association of Principals of Secondary Schools, and this, the, bi the 28th Biennial Conference. And the theme, of course, for this year is breaking barriers 
transitioning beyond the norm. And um, the res Restore a Sense of ICANN, the RSC, uh, who is our secretariat, and they are also the provider of the platform that is being used for this year's conference. Um, don't forget to visit the ABCD website, that is www.artbycreativedesign.org, right? And follow us, Art by Creative Design, on Instagram and on Facebook. So make sure that you stop by our ABCD booth. The link is in the chat, right? Yeah, now you'll put the link to that in the chat so people can get their all access pass for what is happening this week here, right? To see what else we have on this week. Um, tomorrow, join us at 2 p.m. for our Junior Creative Arts Studio um, and our second session of Talking the Things. So thank you very much to our panelists, Dr. Josephine Torrell brown Mr. Marlon DeBeek, Mr. Paul Julian, and Ms. Rita Antwine. Thank you so much, everybody. Yeah, and everybody, please take care and continue doing what you have to do to remain safe and healthy in the middle of this pandemic. All right? Take care and we'll see you right back here tomorrow, God willing. Well done, Deborah. Thank you. Good job, panelists. Have a blessed evening. Thank you. Marlon, I need to talk to you. <laughs> Call me. <laughs>